So um, anyway, I, I was going to just spend the rest of today or a lot of today talking more background astronomy. And next week, I think we're going to take a totally different tack and talk a little bit about um, stuff that's more relevant for what you're doing in the labs. You know, how do we measure stars? How do we do aperture photometry? How do we measure stars' brightness with time? And what do we do with that information? And uh, I don't know exactly how we're going to present that, but it's conceivable that Keaton might present something. Do you think so, Keaton? OK, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, the idea is, again, we're spiraling through. And so this is our final death spiral on the theory. And we'll start a new spiral on um, the observations next time. So uh, I realize a lot of you guys had um, stellar evolution or um, astronomy 307. That's the 307 or 309? 307, the, the good one, um, the one for astronomy majors and uh, science majors. And so you talked about all this stuff, but frankly, hearing it again is fine. Um, the sun burns hydrogen into helium. Um, and in order to do so, it has to burn a lot per second. And it has to turn about 660 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second just to stay afloat, which sounds like a lot, but of course, the sun is big. And so it can actually, if you burned all the hydrogen, it would live for about um, a long, long time. It would live for about 80 billion years. And in practice, the sun's only going to burn about a tenth of that. And it's going to live for about 10 billion years. It doesn't burn all the hydrogen because the hydrogen farther out from the core never gets hot enough to fuse. And again, if you had an astronomy course, you know that the brightnesses of stars vary hugely. A 40 solar mass star is 400,000 times as bright as the sun. And a 3.5 solar mass star is still 80 times as bright as the sun. But a half solar mass star is only about 8% as bright as the sun. So there's a huge logarithmic range of stellar brightnesses. And to go along with that, there's this huge divergence of ages. Um, these stars are so bright that even though they have 40 times the fuel, they spend it 400,000 times faster. So the lifetime is only about a million years. Um, whereas for three and a half solar masses, it's like 440 million years. And the sun, of course, is um, like uh, 10 billion years. And this half a solar mass guy, he's only going to last, well, he only, he's going to last for 56 billion years, which is over four times the age of the universe. So none of those stars have really aged appreciably at all. Um, we've never seen one evolve. So everything you make, all statements you make about those stars evolving are purely theoretical. Kind of a funny thought, you know? It'd be like, you know, on Earth you'd study different animals and they all have different lifespans. And we were studying one class of animal which had never grown old and died yet. It'd just be kind of funny. So um, here's pictorially. Um, the different structures of, of different mass stars, but it's not really to scale. Um, well, maybe it is to scale. It just doesn't go up to 40 solar masses, which would be a lot bigger and a lot brighter. Um, the main thing is that for low mass stars, it turns out that they are basically boiling or convecting the whole, whole the way from the center to the surface. So the energy is generated in the core, and the way it gets out is these convective bubbles going up and down. So it's sort of a fire brigade approach. You know, it heats up the fluid here, rises to the surface, and carries the energy. And then the energy is radiated away. And it's because at these low temperatures, the gas is really opaque. It's hard for the energy to leak out directly. But for a star like the sun, um, for a star like the sun, the interior is radiative. It's hotter. And the energy can get through. It's less opaque. And it's only near the surface where things get cooler that you have a convection zone. And as you go to bigger and bigger stars, um, it turns out that the outer s parts of the star now are completely radiative. They're hot enough that the material is fairly transparent. But you're generating energy so fast in the core that there's not enough time for it to get out due to radiation, so it has a convective core. So you can think of the core as doing this. And then once the energy gets part of the way out, it can leak out normally. Did you have a question, William? OK. Anyway, that's just kind of cool. So there's the, where a convection zone is in a star depends on its mass. 
And here's the famous plot, the thing called the main sequence. And again, if you just took a census of the stars in the sky and put them randomly on this diagram where this is hot, cold, and this is dim and this is bright, then most of the stars lie along this thing called the main sequence. Thanks, Arena. And we now know that the thing that determines where on the main sequence a star lands when it's born is simply its mass. So this is higher mass and this is lower mass. So a two solar mass star would be like, well, where is it? A three solar mass star would be like here. And that's all there is to it. There was a really, really old member of the astronomy department many, many years ago, a guy named David Evans. I think he lived into his 90s. And that, he died like 10 years ago. So when he took astronomy, it was the 20s, you know? And he said, well, when I took astronomy, they told us this is the main sequence. Stars start out up here, and they evolve down this way. You know, and so they get down here when they're old. Literally, that's what they thought. Well, they didn't really think it, but they didn't have a better idea. And when you have a bad idea versus no idea, the bad idea really sticks around. So as a result, they called these stars early type stars and these stars late type stars. And guess what? We still use those names today. We call these stars early type and these stars late type, and it comes from that completely incorrect model. But we haven't given up the nickname that it gave us for these kind of stars. Is that crazy or what? That's insane. So the idea was, the idea was, and it was totally demonstrably false, if you had a big ball of gas and it's collapsing, it's big, so it'll be hot, and that's when they're up here, and then they keep collapsing down, and they become smaller and dimmer. The problem is, when a gas gets compressed, it actually gets hotter. So if anything, they should have evolved this way. You know, they should have, <laughs> the theory would predict the stars evolved this way, <laughs> and the data said they evolved this way, and yet they didn't throw away the theory. Isn't that funny? Anyway, that's where the name early type stars come from. So these stars over here are still called early type stars. Yeah, somebody had a question. Yeah. yeah I, well, just a second, there's one there. Well, so they you mean really, what they real do, yes. So now, exactly, so now a star like the sun runs out of hydrogen, it starts to swell, and its outer layers get big, and uh, it cools off and becomes red. They don't, they don't follow that line at all. Right? Which line? That line the main sequence? Nope, nope, in fact, yeah, they never move this way. They never move this way. I mean, there's a, there's a slight, they may do this, but then they turn off. Um, so yeah, now we know that there's a unique place along the main sequence if you know the mass of a star. I'm sorry, you mean when it comes back this way? Yeah. Um, I can't remember if I have another plot later. It doesn't really show it on this plot, but what's happening as you go up here is you're continuing to burn hydrogen, but not in the not in a core anymore. You're burning it in a shell around the helium core. And due to various things, it's burning really hot. So the core is getting hotter and shrinking a little. And the outer layers, though, due to this intense heat, are actually expanding. It's like, it's like you're heating up the layers and they expand off. And so that continues up till here. And at some point, the helium core gets large enough to ignite helium. And when helium burning starts, then the star will start to move this way some. But then, you know, it'll sort of hang out here. And eventually, when it runs out of things to burn, it'll just move this way and down. And so when it makes the final move this way, it's when it's run out of things to burn. Uh, but that's different for every star. A, sun -like, a star like the sun will be able to burn helium, but nothing else. But a 10 solar mass star will be able to burn helium, carbon, oxygen, neons, maybe silicon. Can't they burn all those iron? If they're big enough. The sun can't. So large stars can. Yeah. OK. Good questions. And if, if any of you all don't understand the question, feel free to ask questions on the questions. Seriously. So people who do stellar evolution tend to think in terms of low mass and high mass stellar evolution. And to me, eight solar masses is a high mass, but 
Low mass stellar evolution is considered to be anything under eight masses. Well, some people consider it everything under eight masses, and high mass is everything over eight masses. Um, and I guess I shouldn't keep you guys in the dark. The reason for that is we think stars less than eight solar masses wind up making white dwarfs, and we think that greater than eight solar masses, they make other things, like supernovae, type two supernovae, and neutron stars and black holes. We think that's what happens. This number eight is not extraordinarily well known. It may be a number between eight and 10. We don't know where that real cusp is between low mass and high mass, but it's around eight. Do you want to add anything to that, JJ? So if you happen to know better numbers than I do, let me know. So what we think happens, it's just what I said. A star runs out of hydrogen in its core. Um, all the hydrogen in the core has been converted to helium. There's still hydrogen farther out in the star. Since you're no longer burning anything in the core, the core col collapses or contracts. But since it's a gas and it contracts, it heats up. So now it's really hot in the center. That extra heat will start hydrogen fusing in a shell just around the core. So there's still hydrogen just above the core, so it starts burning. And actually, the intense heat source makes it burn really hot. And um, this extra hotness causes the outer layers to puff up. So it's kind of weird. A, red, a, a normal star that becomes a red giant, the outer layers swell, but the core contracts. So they're kind of going in two ways at once. Um, but anyway, so hydrogen burns, and this produces helium, and the helium just collects on top of the helium core, and so this core gets bigger and bigger until eventually it gets dense enough that um, helium starts to burn. And depending on the stellar mass, it can be a helium flash, which means it's unstable. So the core starts to burn all at once, or it's sort of a runaway. And on a really short time scale of like an hour, minutes to an hour. And so basically, if it's, a, if it's a lower mass star, like a two or three solar mass star, when the helium starts to burn, it'll be a runaway. And eventually, the core will sort of puff up, cool off, stop burning, slowly settle back down. And then it'll flash again and slowly settle back down. And it may do this a thousand times. Um, it used to be when you're making models of these stars and you got to this point, you couldn't calculate anything anymore because you'd been used to taking time steps in your models of hundreds of millions of years or maybe a million years or maybe 10,000 years and all of a sudden your time steps drop down to like 30 seconds, you know? And so it just became too slow. Nowadays, we can actually integrate through the helium flashes. Um, so we can deal with it, but it's still pretty inconvenient. If the star is more massive, um, say an eight solar mass star, then when this happens, the helium doesn't flash, it just starts burning nice and continuously. And that's because the core isn't degenerate. We can talk about these ideas some more uh, later, but there is this dichotomy between, um, between lower and higher mass stars. The irony here is the core is flashing, but it's the core. So what you see on the outside is nothing. You just see nice steady output of radiation. But down there, something is really amazing is happening in the center of the star over and over again. Um, but since that energy can't instantaneously get to the surface, you don't really see anything. So again, continuing this, the star moves up the red giant branch, and right here it starts burning helium, and then the star sort of settles over here on what we call the horizontal branch. And I think that was sort of your question about what's going on there. This doesn't look very good. So, um, you know, it's harder and harder to burn um, heavier and heavier elements. Hydrogen fuses at about 15 million degrees. Helium is about 170 million degrees. Carbon's at 700 million degrees. Neon's at 1.4 billion. Oxygen is at 1.9 billion. And silicon's at 3.3 billion, which is really hot. You know, this is almost a thousand times hotter than the center of the sun. Um, the sun will never be able to do that. The only stars that can do that are massive stars. So here's a, a cutaway of a model, a cartoon of a massive star, 15 solar masses. And so 
this one's burned all the way to high iron. So it's got a 1.3 solar mass iron core in it. It's surrounded by a silicon shell where silicon's being burned. Surrounded by an oxygen shell where oxygen's being burned. Same with carbon. Same with helium. And there's probably a hydrogen burning shell here too. Um, so anyway, that's the, um, that's what we think the structure of a massive star is right before something dramatic is about to happen. Um, what do you all think happens next? Yeah, pretty much. That's what we think. Uh, we think this star goes supernova. The interesting thing is, is if you were able to cut a star up and look at it and you saw this, you would know that the star probably only has about another year to live. When you get to this stage, the structure um, starts changing rapidly. So like it might have been on the main sequence for say 30 million years and then it was burning helium for maybe 3 million years and then it was burning carbon for maybe half a million years and by the time you get down to, to burning oxygen and silicon, silicon burning takes like a year. Then, then when you eventually reach a temperature where iron would start to burn, um, you run into a problem because all of those other elements, when they burn, they release energy. But carb iron is actually the most stable nucleus. What that means is when you split it apart, it actually sucks energy out of the system. So when you start to try to burn iron, uh, the iron nucleus breaks apart and that takes energy out of the system instead of adding it. And so the core cools off. So the core cools off, it shrinks. Well, and then more, you know, more iron does that. And so you're sucking energy out of the core. You're causing the core to collapse. And then the, the, basically the star collapses on itself, sort of like these buildings that you see get blown up. You know, they blow out all the supports and the building just goes like this. So what we think happens is that the iron starts to burn. And I forget what happens exactly, but within, Within seconds, it's disintegrated. A lot of energy has been sucked out, and the star starts to collapse. Um, then you reach really high densities in here, and there's something called bounce, core bounce. Um, and the star blows up from that point. So it's an implosion followed by an explosion, and that leads to the supernova. That's a really sketchy treatment. I'm sorry, I don't really understand the, uh, the physics going on in the supernovae of these types of stars all that well, but that's, that's basically what happens. And we see stars for which this is a good model. You know, we see supernovae that seem to fit uh, this general category. We've identified in a few cases the star that actually blew up, for instance. And we've said, oh, okay, it did look like it was an evolved high mass star. Um, not easy to do, right? Because you don't know which star is gonna go supernova. They happen rarely. And so going back when you see a supernova and trying to identify which star in the field it was is not easy. Usually they're so far away you couldn't possibly see the star. But in few cases they're in nearby enough galaxies that you can identify which star it is. Yeah, is there a question out here? Okay. Anyway, so that's what we call a type two supernova. And the type two means observationally that it has hydrogen lines in its spectrum. But what type two means to me is it's a massive main sequence star or a massive star that blew up. So here's sort of a, a pictorial representation of um, high mass versus low mass. So here's low mass. You get a star like the sun. It turns into a red giant. It loses a lot of mass, like half of its mass or 90% of its mass, and it becomes a white dwarf. And 97% of the stars do this. Another thing I should say, you know, the, the massive stars are really bright. They're also really rare. You know, a 10 solar mass star is kind of a one in a thousand kind of star. So 97% of all stars are less than eight solar masses, and they fall into this category. The high mass stars, you know, they start out on the main sequence. They're hotter and bluer. They become red supergiants. We believe that they all become supernovae. All we know for sure is that a lot of them do, or some of them do. You know, we, we, it's, you can't say all of them do, but we think, we think left to their own devices, they would all become supernovae. And we think that they can form a black hole afterwards or a neutron star afterwards. Um, and I think most people believe they probably form one of those two. 
but you can't say for certain that there's always a remnant. Maybe it just blows everything up. You know what I mean? We'll never be able to say for certain because you can't look at all of them. Um, and when I say blow all everything up, of course it wouldn't be everything, but there might be a five Earth mass thing that's left in the middle, you know, or a Jupiter mass. We're, 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 I'm talking about stuff that's of order the size of a star. Um, it makes sense that there will be a. Um, it makes sense that there will be a remnant, because, you know, when things explode, everything moves outward, but you kind of expect the velocity field of the explosion to be continuous, in the sense that if you're just to the right of the core, stuff is going this way, and if you're just to the left of the core, it's going this way. So you'd expect the stuff right in the core to kind of not be moving. You know what I mean? And so you'd expect there to be something left. Um, I, but if you put it in a tight binary, I really don't know what the presence of another star would do to there being a remnant. Anyway, interesting thoughts. Are most stars binary? Yeah, two thirds of stars are in binary systems. Now, not all of those stars in binary systems, though, are close enough that they affect each other much. Some are kind of have a long distance relationship, you know. It's only it's only some subset of them that are. Um, close enough that they'll interfere with each other as they're trying to evolve. All right, so continuing to be sketchy. Um, after the star is, say it doesn't blow up. <laughs> say we're not talking about a type 2 supernova, we're talking about a lower mass star. Then eventually when they're done burning the heaviest element they can, they can burn, they sort, of, they sort of fizzle. And so the nuclear reactions gradually turn off and the star starts gradually shrinking. And as it shrinks, it heats up. And so in going from here to here, you know, it's going from cooler to hotter. Um, now since it's shrinking, its surface area is getting smaller, right? So you'd expect it to be getting dimmer. But it's getting hotter, so its surface is getting brighter. It turns out that those two things compensate and the change in surface area is made up for by the change in temperature and they evolve at almost constant luminosity. So they move over here for a while and then eventually they, they do something we call it getting on the white dwarf cooling track. Uh, the star reaches a maximum temperature and starts to become a white dwarf. And along here they're basically constant radius and just cooling off. So they go from they go from shrinking, shrinking, shrinking to kind of finding a constant radius because electron degeneracy pressure keeps them from collapsing anymore. And then they start the standard white dwarf cooling off. And here's a picture of a white dwarf. Not really very remarkable. There's better pictures, but uh, this is one of the most nearby. This is Sirius, Sirius A, Sirius B. Um, there's actually a tribe in Africa that claim to worship Sirius B, which is kind of odd. There shouldn't be any way that they could possibly know that there's a, a white dwarf. It's, it's, oh yeah, lots of people have claimed that. I think probably they just got lucky, you know, because they also believe in a Sirius C, a third component that we don't know about. So I think Sirius is one of the brightest stars in the sky. So that's why they have mythology concerning it, you know. But you can say anything you want. By the way, does anybody here watch Ancient Aliens on the History Channel? It is awesome. Have you seen it? It is the wildest, craziest stuff I have ever seen. You can just laugh the entire hour. It, and it makes you angry, but it's really funny, too. <laughs> And my wife commented, she said, to be an ancient, ancient astronaut theorist, that's it. To be an ancient astronaut theorist, you have to have great hair. <laughs> they all have this moose thing, and they are, they are characters. Um, you, you might check it out. It really is entertaining. Um, I highly recommend it. That, that's, it's, a, it's the best example of doing bad science I've ever seen. Because you'll have one guy looking at some evidence on one show saying, well, that supports the ancient astronauts. On the very next show, he's looking at exactly the same evidence and saying something totally different. It's great. And uh, they, they have no conscience. None. <laughs> so anyway, 
Um, yeah, they had lots of theories about, about this tribe in Africa. Um. <laughs> oh, there's some great ones. So anyway, um, here's a really nice uh, uh, picture of a supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A, Cass A, and it's the brightest radio source in the sky. Um, so when you turn on your radio telescope and point it up, this looks like the sun in the radio. And it's a type 2 supernova. And probably the most famous one is the Crab supernova. And this one actually was recorded in uh, historical records, I'm sure by the Chinese. I don't know if it was written down anywhere in Europe or not. Um, but it's very, very definitely it was noticed at least in civilized regions of the world. Um, and it was also a type 2 supernova. And it had, oh, and here's a, here's a nice cheesy, nice cheesy animation. I'm not sure exactly what this animation is. I think it's half physics and half art. So it's a, here's the explosion. And the subsequent, so the explosion itself took, you know, hours. But then the remnant continues to expand for hundreds of years. And what they tried to do is make it look exactly like the present day Crab Nebula. So it's somewhere between physics and art. Uh, and it does look a lot like the Crab Nebula. Um, one really neat thing you can do with the Crab is since you know when it blew up, and you know how far away it is, and you know how big it is in the sky, you can work out how fast this, this stuff is moving. You know, because you can take this distance divided by a thousand years, and that's the velocity it was going at. That's kind of cool. So it's really neat that you can use historical records and actually derive um, interesting constraints on, on real objects. Now the crab is of course famous because it actually has a neutron star. One of the reasons it's famous is it has a neutron star at the center. And, oh boy. I haven't really explained electron degeneracy pressure, have I? Well, and this is neutron degeneracy pressure. Okay. It is, it is. <laughs> but, okay, uh, how many people have heard of the Pauli exclusion principle? Okay, somebody tell me what it means. You. Yeah, what do you mean by properties? Um, more or less right. Okay, let me rephrase it slightly. You can't have two particles in the same quantum state. Now they can get out of being in the same state by one being up and one being down. There's another way they can get out of being in the same state. They can be at the same place and the same spin if they have different something else. No. What? Energy. Hey, sounds good. Yeah. Technically, momentum, but I'll take energy. So, in other words, if you put an electron, you can put a spin up electron. Say this is, say this is the energy, and this is the ground state energy. So, you can put, in this energy state, you can put an up electron and a down electron. And if you want to put another electron at the same location, then you have to put it at a slightly higher energy. You just do. Now you can still put another one in because it's different because it's spin, but as you keep piling them in, you have to give, you have to keep making their energies distinct. So when you cram a whole bunch together, some of them aren't moving fast, but some of them are. Okay? So these are, these velocities of the electrons have nothing to do with how hot they are. They're with how jammed together they are. But they're still velocities, and you know, it's the velocities of the particles in this room that create a pressure as they bounce off the walls. These electrons are whizzing around, and so they bounce off of things too, and they create a pressure. So it's the pressure of electrons that are being squeezed together is called electron degeneracy pressure. Does that make sense? Now you may argue why this Pauli exclusion principle is true, but let's just assume it's true. Um, then. So this degeneracy pressure is independent of temperature. I could have these particles as cool as I want, and the electrons are still whizzing around because they can't stop. If they stopped, they, they couldn't stay at the same place. They'd have to go somewhere else. So the fact that I'm confining them makes some of them go fast. 
So this is electron degeneracy pressure. Yeah, now gravity is the thing squeezing everything together. So gravity sort of provides the energy to pump them up. But so what that says is as gravity tries to squeeze it together, the electrons go faster and they exert more force to oppose gravity. Okay? So if gravity squeezes too hard, the electrons basically push back. And so this degeneracy pressure keeps white dwarfs up, and it'll work forever. You know, the sun isn't stable forever, but a white dwarf really is forever, because it'll never collapse beyond that point. Even if it cools off to absolute zero, it won't collapse. All right, well, that's electron degeneracy pressure. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to ignore the quantumness the fundamental little quantumness, because I didn't study it before I came down here. It turns out that electrons are really light. You know, they have small mass compared to protons and things. So it's, it's easier to make them degenerate when you're squeezing things together. Um, they get in each other's way sooner, is another way of putting it. If I try to cram a bunch of neutrons together at the same densities, they don't care at all. I have to get to really high densities before the neutrons start to experience this Pauli exclusion principle. And so a neutron star, you really have to cram the neutrons together about a thousand times denser, actually about 10 to the 5 times denser um, than, um, than the electrons do. So uh, in, in other words, a white dwarf is this big and a neutron star is this big, uh, same mass. Um, and it, the reason it is is because neutrons are 2,000 times heavier than electrons, and it affects things. So anyway, that was a really hand-wavy way of saying it. They're held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. They were actually hypothesized to exist, I think, in the late 30s, and nobody ever thought you would detect one, because if you work out the radii of these stars, it's like 10 kilometers. So how are you going to see something 10 kilometers wide, you know, 100 light years away? You know, 10 kilometers, that's the size of Manhattan. It, you know, how are you going to see that? Um, it turns out there is a way. That, that's remarkable. Um, so they're real dense. They have really high surface gravity. And that's illustrated here. You know, with the flashlight, the beams of light are curved severely uh, in the vicinity of the, uh, the star. It leads to the really entertaining idea that you can see the backside of the star due to the curved light. So if you're over here, then of course you can see light that comes this way, right? Um, but you can, you can see light that takes off at an angle like this, gets bent around, and comes around. And you can see light that takes off here and gets bent around and comes around. You see what I mean? So you can see past past the disk, and that's illustrated here. This is the part that should be straight at the top, and this is the part at the bottom. Anyway, just very cool. Very cool that you can see the curvature of space like that. Um, it turns out that these objects, these neutron stars, can spin really, really fast, and they can have really, really strong magnetic fields. And as a result of the spinning, they can act sort of like a police light that spins, you know? It's just a constant light that spins, but every time it crosses you, you see a flash. And so that's what we think these pulsars are. We think they're neutron stars that are spinning like lighthouses and sending out what to us look like pulses of radiation. And so right in the center of the crab, you can look at an object. Here's a star. And these are all separated by like a millisecond. And you can see that here's something appearing, an extra star, and it goes away, and then it comes back, and then it goes away, and here's a little movie of it, which I hope works. Yeah. But of course you have to do this with extraordinary time resolution. You know, normally you'd take a picture of the sky and you'd, you'd expose for a minute or two, so you'd just see two stars. Somebody had to actually say, you know, maybe we should look every 30th of a second. We might find something. Um, they didn't find this in the optical first. They found it in the radio where it was really easy to get the frequency resolution. And 
they knew that there was a signal there at, at 30 microhertz or 30 um, millihertz. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, back to the summary of things. Um, summary of stellar life cycles. So the, the wrinkle I want to add in here is the low mass star evolution. Yeah, a single star produces a white dwarf, but imagine that that white dwarf had a companion. If this companion comes, uh, turns into a red giant and dumps mass on the white dwarf, eventually the white dwarf will explode uh, and produce what's called a type 1 supernova, type 1A actually. Um, and the reason it does that, which again, you'll just have to accept on faith, this, this electron degeneracy pressure, it works up to a point. The problem is, is the electrons um, as they continue to get squeezed down tighter and tighter, what's the maximum velocity the electrons can go? Right, so they can't go infinitely fast. As a result of that, in a way, they can't generate infinite pressures. You know what I mean? It's, it's more subtle than that, but basically, there comes a point where they can't quite push back on gravity hard enough, and gravity wins. So we think the white dwarf collapses. Um, and then a miracle occurs, and the star explodes. We know in the process, <laughs> yeah, say the white dwarf was made out of carbon and oxygen, what we think happens is all the carbon gets burned. So the incredible, you know, instead of taking 100 million years to burn one solar mass of carbon, it does it in a few seconds and produces a huge explosion. Um, we think, or rather we don't have any evidence that there are any remnants left when a white dwarf blows up. So we don't think a neutron star comes from that. <coughs> but um, we have no evidence either. I mean, I'd be surprised if there was something left. But there probably isn't a one solar mass object that's left. Yeah, Rena. Well, it, it has to collapse. Um, oh, OK, sorry about that. Yes, well, I'm leaving out lots of physics here. So I've been talking about the electrons, you know, they have this degeneracy pressure, but there's actually all the carbon nuclei there too. Well, it turns out the more mass you dump on a white dwarf star, the smaller it gets. It's, it's backwards. The bigger a white dwarf is, the less mass it has. The smaller it is, the more mass it has. I like to think of it as like spring-loaded. Imagine there's a spring that you're pressing down with gravity, you know, so you dump more on there and it compresses. You dump more on there and it compresses more. So the more matter you dump on a white dwarf, the smaller it gets. So uh, if you carry this argument to an extreme, around 1.4 solar masses, the radius goes to zero. You know, so you know something bad is going to happen right around there. Because it doesn't really go to zero. Something happens first that keeps that from happening. It turns out that the electrons get squeezed into the protons. So it becomes energetically favorable for the electrons and protons to combine to form neutrons. Okay? So all of a sudden, the electrons just go away. They all combine with neutrons, and so you have a soup of neutrons, and now this electron degeneracy pressure that was holding everything up isn't doing anything at all. So the star starts to collapse. Starts to collapse, but then all the carbon gets together and says, hey, we can burn, you know? And so, so you get a, a large reaction. But that's what's going on, and it all happens extremely quickly within a matter of seconds. Um, it's called neutron drip, I think. When the protons start to, because as soon as the first proton starts to combine with the electron, the pressure goes down a little bit, and that makes that happen faster, so it's a runaway. So it is, again, like the building collapsing. So yeah, it's, a, it's pretty entertaining. Um, anyway, these are the type of supernovae we think they're always a 1.4 solar mass white dwarf that's blowing up. Not like the type twos. They might be 10 solar masses. They might be 50 or 100. They're all different. These are all 1.4 solar mass white dwarfs. So it's not surprising that they're pretty identical. In other words, they all have very similar um, luminosities. Um, since they're sort of identical, um, they make excellent standard candles. <coughs> They're not totally standard, but they're standardizable. So you can look at a given supernova and say, yeah, that's how, that's how bright it is, really. 
and you say, yeah, but it looks really dim. Oh, well, then it must be very far away. Or if you see the same supernova nearby, you're like, wow, that's really bright. It must be close. So you can figure out how far things are away because intrinsically they're all about the same brightness. You can't do that with type 2 supernovae. It just doesn't work. Some of them are way brighter than others. <coughs> so these are the objects that are uh, used to determine distances to very distant galaxies. And um, when dark energy was first hinted at or discovered in the late 90s, it was on the basis of uh, these, these supernovae data. It, it was this data that showed that the universe could be expanding actually more quickly rather than slowing down. It was the type 1A supernovae data. And here's a um, type 1A that went off in our galaxy in uh, 1572, Tycho's supernova, seen by Tycho Brahe, who, by the way, didn't use telescopes. It was all naked eye astronomy. So he didn't see this. Um, does anybody have questions on black holes? <laughs> I mean, I think they're fascinating, but perhaps we're getting a little far afield. Um, the only thing really to know is that the obvious that light can't escape from them. So right here on this surface is the surface inside of which light can't escape. So right above this surface, if the light is going straight out, it can get away. But even if it's going a little sideways, it's going to get trapped. Um, one interesting thing you can have is you can actually have orbits. The light can orbit. So there's a radius at which the light goes around. And if you're really into like the mathematical intricacies of general relativity, you can have solutions where the black hole is spinning. And in that case, it drags space time around with it, sort of like water going down a drain, literally. And so in the direction that it's spinning, light can orbit it closer because it's kind of spinning with it. But light that's going the opposite direction has to be a lot farther away to keep from getting captured. So you can have light in two different circular orbits going two different directions due to the fact that space time is being dragged around. That's pretty cool. I don't think there's any observational evidence for that, but that's what Einstein's theory says. All right, well, perhaps we better stop here. Um, we are now to white dwarfs. <laughs> so white dwarfs are held up by this electron degeneracy pressure, and this is really important. Um, it means that as they cool off, they don't really shrink much. That's really easy, right? You know, it's sort of like imagine a block of metal that's heated up. You put it on the table and watch it cool off. It doesn't really change size. Yeah, it shrinks by maybe a tenth of a percent. And white dwarfs sh shrink by maybe one or two percent. But the, the physics of it cooling off is actually pretty simple. And the simplicity allows us to model them with confidence, you know, so that we can really say this white dwarf is 8 billion years old rather than a main sequence star where we're saying, well, you know, it could be 8 billion years old. It could be 12. We're not entirely sure uh, because, because there are uncertainties in the modeling. All right. Well, I'll let you guys go. Are there any questions? If you have any questions, you don't want Yeah, Keaton. You have what? The homework? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Oh, yes, lab books. That's right, I, I wrote you yesterday, right? Yes, so um, just put them up here on the table. Yeah, and anybody has lab they haven't turned in yet that they have? Go ahead and continue working on it. Do you need the notebook to do the lab? Yeah, you do, don't you? Okay, just hang on to it then. But you'll turn that in with the lab. Uh, next week, okay? And I'd like, yeah, I would.